Good evening and welcome to Syracuse class. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organizations. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational religious and scientific research organization that is dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of the eternal purpose pattern and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. Uh, since that time, we have established branch schools across the United States, Canada, and other foreign countries. This Syracuse branch was established in 1969. This time I'd like to acknowledge the Dean of the Syracuse branch, Dr. Patrick Trevison, our President, Dr. Robert Welch, and our Vice President, Dr. John Cometti. Now, in this school, throughout the lecture this evening, we'll be using the true, correct, and original name and title for the Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. True name of your Heavenly Father is Yahweh. This has been mistranslated in most Bibles, or replaced with the title Lord. For the Word of Son, we use a divine title Elohim. This has been erroneously substituted with the title God. And the name of the Holy Spirit manifesting in or out of physical body is Yahshua Messiah. This has been erroneously substituted with Jesus or Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. We now know each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, so unlike Lord and God, is a divine title, which means that Elohim is the title that your Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into an encyclopedia or dictionary would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, or the Latin language contain any character or letter in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was there J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible and untrue renderings of the true name of the Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Now, Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, is pure spirit. And in this pure spirit state, He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in His pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely shows a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. And if you take a look at this chart, you'll see that we have this fiery cloud painted all the way around the edges of the chart so that everything on the chart is within this fiery cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe, everything in the creation abides within this pure spirit state of Yahweh. And Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive of him in this pure spirit state, takes on shape and takes on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a superincorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This visionary shape and form can only be seen by divine visions and understood by divine revelation. Later on, the self-same spirit manifested himself in the physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? You can get a better understanding of his name and title by reading the preface to a holy name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. We call it a divine pattern because this is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the wilderness of Sinai, he then called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and revealed this tabernacle pattern to him in a vision. Moses was instructed to return to the wilderness and build one exactly as he had seen it in the mount. This tabernacle pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and this court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And in this school, we show proof how that everything is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. 
Now, in this school, we have 10 primary constitutional aims or objectives. They are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there's no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. I'd like to have this evening's meeting dedicated with a prayer by Dr. Lloyd Bennett. That will be followed by a scripture reading, which is Romans, the ninth chapter. Our scripture readers this evening are Dr. Deb Cometti and Dr. Scott Miller. Good evening, class. Good evening, Lord. <clears throat> Take a moment and bow our hearts and minds onto our Heavenly Father, Yahweh. And we thank Him. Yahshua, we, we thank You. We so thank You for gathering us together. We thank You, Yahshua, for keeping us strong, for keeping us focused, for giving us a place to meet, Yahshua that we can deal with these things and always keep you in our heart and mind and that you would continue to feed us and keep us here. That we would be so happy within this truth and be so happy that we have a place to come that we can continue to learn about you. We are thankful, Yahshua. We love you and there's nothing more important in one voice, may we all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm flashing red. Do you want to stop it for so I could change the batteries? Oh, I'm ready for Scott. I'm ready for you. Good evening, class. Good evening. Tonight's scripture will be read out of the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts revised by A.P. Train of the Scripture Research Association. Romans, the ninth chapter. I say the truth in the Messiah, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from the Messiah for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who were Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of Yahweh, and the promises. Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, the Messiah came, who is over all, blessed forever? Not as though the word of Yahweh hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac that shall thy seed be called. 
that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of Yahweh, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time I will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of Yahweh according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with Yahweh? By no means. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of Yahweh that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, in whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against Yahweh? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the power, potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if Yahweh, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he hath afore prepared unto glory? Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of all of the nations, of which he spake through Hosea, saying, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall be called the children of the living Elohim. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will Yahweh make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except Yahweh Seboeth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then, that the nations which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which is followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumble stone, stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, yet whosoever believeth on him shall not be disappointed. That's Romans the ninth chapter. Dr. Miller and Dr. Lloyd Bennett for the prayer. And for our first speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce the Dean of Syracuse Branch, Dr. Patrick Tursa. Everybody. Good evening. I probably be I probably will not be a long time. It's uh not easy standing on one leg. So the other night when we had class in Syracuse, uh there was a fellow from um Meridian, Mississippi, who's a, a pretty, pretty decent teacher. And he did a nice job and he worked with blood, water and spirit. 
And you know, and it was one of those kind of lectures where in the middle of it, you're, you, for, you stop listening because you think, well, I've heard this a million times. But I laid in bed a couple of nights later and I thought about what he had been saying. And it was so important, specifically what he had been saying. And so I want to go where he was. And I think that was back in Exodus, the fourth chapter. I'm not going to take a whole lot of time, okay? I just want to bring this out, and there's a reason why. Because classes, there are classes all around the country that are having problems. And they're having problems because people are introducing all kinds of different theories, theories and concepts and different trains of thought and things which they are not backing up with the law and the prophets. Right. And you, you can't accept something just because it sounds good or because it makes a lot of sense. Right. That's no criteria. And uh, so we're going to read here in Exodus 4, and I, th I think you got to start, you got to pick it up right in the first verse. Yes. One nine. Exodus 4 and 1. Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, Yahweh hath not appeared unto thee. And Yahweh said unto him, What is in thine hand? So Yahweh said to Moses, What's in your hand, right? Yahweh Elohim said to him, What's in your hand? Read. And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground. And he cast it, it on the ground. Became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Put forth thy hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Okay. That they may believe that Yahweh Elohim of their fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. And Yahweh said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thy hand in thy bosom again. And he put his hand in his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. So we've been listening to these things since we first came into class many, many years ago. And uh, so the principles we want to work with are blood, water, and spirit. And they're up here on this chart. And hold this here where we are, and we want to go over to 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Because that's what's up on this chart up here. Up here. What is it? 5, 7? First John five, seven, and eight. Thank you. Okay, first John five and seven. For there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. There are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And it's we're not, of course, you understand, dealing with the Trinity. We're dealing with the unity. And it's not my purpose to go into the Godhead because if I do, <laughs> I'll just get lost there. But go ahead and read. And these three are one. These three are one. These three are one. It's a unity. Read, please. And there are three that bear witness in earth. Now there are three that bear witness in the earth. The spirit and the water. 
In the blood. The spirit, the water, and the blood. Here they are, right there. This is the reason why they're painted up there on that chart. Not because somebody thought it looked cool. These are the three that bear witness in the earth. Or you could say death, burial, and resurrection. But for our purpose right now, we're dealing with blood, water, and spirit. And uh, Trell, this fellow's name is Trell Johnson. Uh, he became emotional. Uh, they teach some funny things in his school, okay? I've never heard him teach those things. He teaches things pretty straight, pretty square and pretty by the book. His witnesses are pretty by the book. And he's pretty much, he pretty much abides by the fact that the, the law and the prophets are extremely important. So, he was talking about this blood, water, and spirit. And he talked about how Moses turned the river, the River Nile, into what? Blood. blood. So you had blood. And it's the river, okay, so you had your principle of water. And it's by the spirit that that is done. And you can pick that up further down in this chapter or in the fifth chapter. I'm not going to take the time to get into it. But there's a there's a purpose in this rod, too. Because this rod, it turned into a serpent. And now when he took that rod down before Pharaoh, Pharaoh's magicians threw their rods down, and their rods turned into serpents. But Moses' rod ate up their rods, which to me is such a pretty principle because it's the truth devouring the lie, overcoming the lie. And it's such a pretty witness. And see, you're picking this up way back with Moses. So you're going back in the Law and the Prophets. You're going back in the book to pick up these witnesses, to pick up these things. And it was by this blood, water, spirit that they got out of bondage, that they got out of Egypt, that they overcame darkness, that they overcame, or that they got out of bondage. And this, down here, this is like the world. This is like the world that we were brought out of. And we were in darkness. And we were in bondage. And we, we were, all these things that Israel was in, under down here, we were too. And we didn't even know it. And it was by coming to class and hearing the witnesses, blood, water, spirit, death, burial, resurrection, that we were brought out of, out of that bondage, out of that darkness, out of that ignorance. Now, I've been talking with um, a good friend of mine down in Florida a lot lately. And uh, 
A lot of people in his class have begun to believe things that were, were never taught there, that they never believed at one time. And I could see this trouble kind of coming when I was down there in February. There are some people down there that they want to be somebody. You can always tell when somebody wants to be somebody. And uh, it's very disheartening to some people down there. And the things that are being taught, they're not, they're not coming out of the book. They're using a quote from a transcript or a quote from something over here or something over there. You can take those things out of context. And the founder said, my job is not to teach anything new. My job is to confirm what is already in the Law and the Prophets, which is what his job was when the whole time he was on the earth plane. He was doing the same thing that Yahshua was doing. He was doing the same thing that Paul was doing. He wasn't doing anything different. Now, you've, you've seen the, the trouble in our school with people that have taught all kinds of different things. And uh, people that we sat with, that we roomed with, that we ate with, that we spent time with, we fished with, we did everything with, and they're gone. They're gone. Just like that, they're gone. And the book said it would be that way. The book did not lie. So it's right here in your book by blood, water, spirit. And I'm laying in bed and I'm thinking about this and thinking about it over and over and over again. And I'm not up here to get into a lot of detail and to get into a lot of everything. But they're saying a lot of these people are saying, you have a choice, and you have free will. And they're not backing it up in the book, but they're saying one of their criteria is that if you didn't have a choice, it wouldn't be fair. Yahweh wouldn't be fair if you didn't have a choice. That's what they're saying. Now, that's why I chose this scripture reading. But I'm, all, I'm not reading a lot of this. I only want to pick up um, we're, in, we're in Romans. We're in 9. All right, I just want to pick it up uh, in the 11th verse. There's a lot in this chapter, and there's a lot in the 10th chapter. And there's a lot in the whole book of Romans. There's a real lot in the 8th chapter. <laughs> but you see, 
This is an epistle that R Paul wrote to the people who had a class in Rome, Italy. And he's basing that on things in the law and in the prophets. When you look at Paul's writings, if you look to see how he's basing his writings in the law and in the prophets, it makes his writings much easier to understand. They're not as weird. To, you're not trying to interpret what Paul's saying. You don't need to interpret him. He's saying what he means to say. And he's, he's laying it right out there for you. It's just as plain as could be. The founder taught it just as plain as it could be. Yahshua taught it as plain as it could be. <clears throat> And that's how it was when I first came into this class. And you could go anywhere in this country. And they were all teaching the same thing. Isn't that right, Carl? As long as Dr. Kinley was alive. As long as he was alive. <laughs> you know the old expression, when the cat's away. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, yes, let's just pick up... And like I say, we could, uh, we could spend much more time in the Law and in the Prophets to prove out what we're saying. But we're going to pick it up here in 11 so that I can sit down so that you can hear from someone else. So go ahead and read, please. And I'm doing this because this kept me up all night. And I just kept thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. And how important this is. And people are saying, well, it wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be fair if you didn't have a choice. Read, please. Romans 9 and 11. For the children being not yet born neither having done any good or evil. Now the children, they weren't even born yet. Mm -hmm. They're talking about Jacob and Esau. Mm -hmm. Hey, they weren't even born yet. Mm -hmm. They're in the womb. Read. That the purpose of Yahweh, according to election, might stand. That the purpose might stand. There's a purpose in operation. And fairness doesn't enter into it. <laughs> Look, back here at Mount Sinai, he gave out a law and he told Moses, take this down and have them vote on it. No. No. Wait a minute, what are you at? I thought he was setting up a democracy. <laughs> you understand? It was never a democracy. He told them what he wanted them to do, and they said, We will. Read, please. Um, that the purpose of Yahweh, according to election, might stand, not of works but of him that call it. Not of works. No, there are no works involved. But by him that call it. That's Yahweh Elwin. That's Yahshua in this covenant. Read. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. The elder shall serve the younger. And you got to go back in the book to pick up a lot of these things. Okay? And you can pick up, if you go back in the book, it says, For Jacob have I loved. 
but Esau have I hated. And that's Yahweh all him saying that while they were yet in the womb. Read. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Yes. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with Yahweh? What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness? Hey, wait a minute. Is he unfair? Is he unfair? These people ought to sit down and get in here and read their book every now and then. Read, please. Um, Yahweh forbid, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, Frank. On whom I will have mercy. See, that's all part of this great purpose that he set in motion. And he then set it in motion way back here way back here read and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion and you can get the witnesses for that all down through the law and the prophets there were those he had compassion on, and there were those that he did not have compassion on. And if we kept reading back there in Exodus, you will read that he hardened Pharaoh's heart. That's right. Well, that didn't seem fair. <laughs> nope. Pharaoh was ready to let him go. And here he hardened his heart. Look, that's his purpose that he set in motion and there's a reason why these things so if you read we got to read down further keep reading please so then it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth it's not of look it's not your will right. it's not your choice That's right. read but of Yahweh that showeth mercy. But of, it's Yahweh that shows mercy. Listen, he is mercy. That's what he is. And he's going to be merciful to everyone that has mercy coming to him. Everyone. And he is perfect justice. And he's going to take care of everybody's soul. And we don't have to worry with it. Right. We don't have to worry with it. Read, please. Uh, for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee. Now that's why he raised Pharaoh up. Yes. I, I get archaeology magazines. I know all about that grandeur that was back there in Egypt. And what he had raised up back there to show his name and to show his power. His power. All of that civilization, thousands of years old, to show his power. Because it's part of his purpose. <laughs> Read, please. Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared. And that Almighty. my name, that don't matter what you call him. 
that my name might be declared. Mm -hmm. Read. That my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he, have mer hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy. He will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. Listen. He is going to have the mercy. That takes you out of the picture. It just takes you out of the picture. I don't mean to sound mean. I'm just reading what's in the book here. And it can be backed up in the law and in the prophets. Read, please. Um, in whom he will, he hardeneth. And he's going to harden who he'll harden. And whose heart he's going to soften, he's going to soften. Read. Thou will say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that replies against Yahweh? Who are you? <laughs> who are you? Who are you? <laughs> Who are you? You want to change his purpose because you don't think it would be fair. Here's your answer right here. I mean, it's right here. Read. Um, Nay, O man, who art thou that replies against Yahweh? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Why have you made me thus? <laughs> Why have you made me thus? Read. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Doesn't the potter have power over the clay? Mm -hmm. Now, who's the potter in this situation? Yahweh. That's Yahweh Elohim or Yahshua. He's the potter. We're the clay. And the clay can't say, hey, I don't want to go in the kiln yet. I don't want to get fired up yet because I don't like the way you made me. Really? <laughs> Read, please. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? One unto honor, one unto dishonor. One to be saved, one to be damned. And we may not think it's fair, and we may not think it's right, but it's his purpose, and it will, it will go forth unimpeded. Read, please. Uh, what if Yahweh, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? What verse you in here? 22. All right, read 23, 20, read to 24, and I'll take my seat. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but... Even us whom he hath called. He called us. He called us. He called us. Each and every one of us. 
Read. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles, yes. That it? That was 24. Okay. And I will take my seat. And tonight I could sleep. That will not be going through my brain and going through my brain and going through my brain like a locomotive. And uh, the whole class the other night, Wednesday night in Syracuse was a, a, a darn nice class. A darn good class. The whole class. If you haven't listened to it, do yourself a favor and listen to it. All praise and glory goes to Yahshua the Messiah. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Trivis. And our next speaker is a visitor from our California, Oceanside, California class, Dr. Carol Endler. Oh, this chapter, this ninth chapter, uh, I have struggled reading this ninth chapter, ninth chapter with people who believe they have a choice. Take this chapter word for word, and there is no way that you can construe in any way, shape, or manner that you have a choice. And the reason that Paul wrote this is because he was contending with people who thought it wasn't fair. That's right. That's right. People who thought they should have some kind of choice. Mm -hmm. Paul has already dealt with what we are dealing with now. Mm -hmm. And I want to say this. Uh, Yahweh, I don't read the Bible that much uh, in terms of sitting and reading and law and prophets. I get all of that from sitting in class and other people having read for the most part. But Yahweh inspired me about two years ago, maybe three. Could have been during COVID because you, we had a lot of time. But when you're retired, it's every year is COVID. So, um, but I read the book of Romans in my paper Bible, and I have a, a, a great margin of the translator in this Bible. Uh, it's the first Bible I ever had when I came into class when Mitchell said, get a Bible with a margin of the translator in it. Don't get some Bible that you're just reading this out. You want to have something that you can follow. And I decided that every time Paul said something in Romans, mm -hmm. I went to the margin, and in the margin was the law of prophets for what he said every single time. And it was tedious and long to read Romans that way. And at first it was like, oh, I can't do this because this has taken a long time. But I was so inspired every time I saw where he was coming from that it was in the Law and the Prophets, That's that right. Yahweh had already said it. Mm -hmm. Yahweh Elohim had already spoken through these prophets and said this. Mm -hmm. And Moses, and, and look at, let's get me uh, 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 Exodus, the fourth chapter. The, I want the burning bush, where yeah. Moses sees this bush that's burning and not being consumed. Is it? Third chapter. Third chapter. See, that's, that's the way it's going to be with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I want to start when Moses first in, encounters this burning bush. Exodus 3 and 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the desert and came to the mountain of Elohim, even to Horeb. And the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. 
And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. All right, stop right there. So here's Moses, normally just feeding his sheep, never having encountered this particular situation that he's seeing now. He's seeing a bush burning, and it's not crumbling into ash. It's not, it, and that no other bush that has ever been on fire has ever not crumbled and burned to ash. What happens here? Read on. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Now, that's all I want about this. Moses, Moses said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn around and see this great sight, why this bush is not burned. Now, doesn't that seem like Moses made the decision and made a point of that I'm making this decision? I'm going to do this. I'm going to turn around and see this great sight, why this is not burned. And to a carnal mind, it looks like Moses made a decision. Yes. But what we have been pointing, we, Dr. Kinley pointed this out, that when Moses was born and uh, uh, his mother saw that he was a goodly child. That that meant that he was born with the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I believe that, I, but I really had no reason to believe, just because Dr. Kindley said it, that goodly child equaled having the Holy Spirit. I had no reason to believe that. But I believed it, number one, because I was new in class, and I believed in, in what di that Dr. Kinley had a divine vision and revelation, and so he's not going to lie to us, and so that's what it means. But that's not something you can take to a, 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 a new person and tell them that Moses had the Holy Spirit. When you want to say, well, this is because what you really have here is a man with the Holy Spirit saying, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why this bush is not burned. You not have a man saying that. You have a man with the Holy Spirit, a very specific situation. Mm -hmm. See, but now you gotta be able to prove that. You gotta be able to establish that that's what it is, and not just Dr. Kinley said it. And so, uh, and this is some things that, uh, I roll around in bed thinking about. I'm one of these, I wake up in the morning and I stay in bed, always scrambling my brains. <laughs> and so what you have with Moses down here, and now remember, this is the beginning of this covenant to Israel. This is before the Ten Commandments were given. Moses has this experience at the burning bush. He's instructed to go down into Egypt and bring the children, and he's given all these signs, which you're right, that class in uh, Syracuse, uh, he, uh, Trell was, was phenomenal. But so this is the beginning of this covenant. And you had a man in the beginning of this covenant being instructed by Yahweh to bring the children of Israel up out of Egypt. So this Moses, as it were, uh, appeared to be the one who delivered Israel. But what we find out is that Moses uh, had a minister called uh, Joshua, properly Yahshua, who, and I'm not going to get into this because this is not my, my reason, but this Yahshua is uh, Yahweh manifested in the flesh, Yahweh Elohim manifested in the flesh, and I say it both ways because this is a unity, period. You can't get away from that, it's, that this is a unity. And so this is Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim manifested in the flesh, and you can find that out because this man uh, had a tent on the backside of the mountain, not a tent with all the rest of the children of Israel. And when Moses wanted to talk to Yahweh, he went to this tent when this man was in this tent. And then a cloud descended to show you what's going on. And what you have later is that uh, uh, when Moses had talked to Yahweh, that Joshua didn't leave the tent and let Moses hang out with Yahweh. Joshua stayed in that tent. And so what we find out is that this is a direct transmutation of the spirit of Yahweh, of the spirit of Yahweh through Yahweh Elohim 
into this flesh. This is a direct transmutation of Yahweh in the flesh. So you've got Moses, a man who's a goodly child, and we're saying a man who has the Holy Spirit, and we have Yahshua, who is the Holy Spirit, and Moses was born with the Holy Spirit. Now watch. Moses is born with the Holy Spirit, and he acts all the way through here with the Holy Spirit, and he comes to the River Jordan, uh, uh, and Moses is not allowed to go over into Canaan's land. Moses is not allowed, but what he does is he transfers his power to Joshua at uh, Yahshua at this Jordan River, and Moses, in a, not in a sense, Moses delivers, or the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that's in Moses, goes into Yahshua, the son of Nun, at that time. And that's one of the reasons why when Moses was up in the mountain, it says that his eyes were not dimmed and his natural forces were not abated. That means that after Moses transferred that spirit, or Yahweh took that spirit from Moses and got that double portion that you can run the train of thought of, Moses had not yet died. He was still in the physical body and went up in the mountain and then he died. Now, what you've got with John the Baptist and I, we're not going to get the scriptures, but uh, it's in there. When uh, Mary uh, 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 encountered Elizabeth, the, ch the children jumped in the wombs. And then it says in the book that John the Baptist was born with the Holy Spirit. It's what it says. Mm -hmm. See? Now, this with John the Baptist is the end of this that was started with Moses and, and Yahshua, the son of Nun. This is the beginning, and this is the end of it. This is the institution, and this is the fulfillment of this old covenant with these children of Israel, and this is the Messiah coming to Israel and to Israel only, the, uh, 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 the, 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 the descendants of the second generation. Not the first generation, because the whole first generation died in the wilderness. This is the descendants of the second generation, which is as the sands of the sea and the stars of, of heaven, but what we find out when the Messiah comes, only a remnant is saved from that. Uh, it, it, there's too much to get into about this, but the point is that John the Baptist was born with the Holy Spirit, and John the Baptist was given the, uh, 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 the, 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 he was told to go and baptize people, not to have them repent their sins. Yes, it's a baptism of repentance, but he was saying, have you sinned? Because he wanted an answer from someone who says no. Because that's how he's going to... Now, now he doesn't know this. He doesn't know this. He just knows that he's supposed to go and baptize a of repentance and just keep asking, have you sinned? And they have to be humble and admit they are, because you get the manifestation of the, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are overlooking this baptism business, and, and, and they're not going down there, because they're not humble of heart in order to do that. And so, and Dr. Kinley goes, what, uh, no, it's not Dr. Kinley, it's in the book. What are you, what, what are you just standing there in the, in, the, in the blowing of the weeds? There's this whole thing about uh, uh, standing in those weeds just looking. What are you, just standing in, uh, out there? That's what they were doing. They were just standing out there judging this thing, and they were judging this wild man. This un... He was... John the Baptist was this wild man out in the wilderness. He was not who you would have expected uh, to do what he's doing, but he was purposed to find the Messiah. And so here's a man with the Holy Spirit now looking for... It's not just another Jew. This is a man with the Holy Spirit. This is a man with the Holy... This is not just some other man. Uh, that's why... I'll just tell you this real quick. That's why when Moses stood at this mountain and Yahweh wanted to wipe out Israel because Israel had built this golden calf, right? And... and Moses says to Yahweh, and Moses meant this. He wasn't just trying to, 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 to uh, 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 fake Yahweh out, you know, get on his good side. 
Moses said this, blot my name out of that book and save these people. See? And so you have Paul who said, and, and Paul meant this. He said uh, his heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved. And at another point he said, I would that I would be lost if for them to be saved. And it, it's not worded exactly that way. But he says the same thing that Moses says. Why? Because Paul is a man with the Holy Spirit. And so Yahshua, I guess it's Yahshua, uh, again, I haven't got all the scriptures there, but he says that you need to lay down your life for your brethren. That's what Moses did. That blot his name out of the book, he's lay, he's lay, he means what he's saying. Paul meant what he said when he said, if I, if I could die and, and, and they would be lived, I would do that for my brethren. He meant that. See, and that's a, an important principle. Why? Because Yahshua did lay down his life. And these people with the Holy Spirit have that same uh, motivation in their hearts. That, and we see these people who have left here, people we cared about, and we would do anything to get them back. And because here's the thing. Uh, uh, and I was was thinking of this as far as choice is concerned, and and I know the situation that 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 Frank, not Frank, Rick, uh, <laughs> that Rick was talking about in Florida, because one of the people who is involved in this mm -hmm. choice business is someone who's very dear to me mm -hmm. from the time he was a kid, yeah. and we have had long discussions. Him and his brother and I have had long discussions about Yahweh's purpose. And I have heard he's one of the ones that have gone to this. And it yeah. hurts my heart yeah. to see this. Because if you have the attitude that you have a choice, then what you are saying is that what I think is more mm -hmm. real than Yahweh, you're lifting yourself up above Yahweh because at no time, at no time uh, uh, has Yahweh indicated down through the Law and the Prophets, and Rick covered this, that there's, that anyone's made a choice. I mean, I, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated and it specifically says before they came out of the womb it's now he's not stupid in the way that he speaks he's not stupid and in this thing here let me just this is one of the things of Paul oh gosh in Romans the, the let me see here which one of these it is Yes. Read 22. 922. I'm not finished with this uh, Moses and, and uh, uh, Yahshua and John the Baptist and Yahshua. This solidifies that Moses had to have the Holy Spirit because in the, be the end is declared from the beginning. So you have to have the same situation. So goodly has to mean that whether you like it or not. Just because it doesn't say Moses was born in the Holy, with the Holy Spirit to satisfy you, it's too bad. The working of the purpose shows forth that that's how it has to be. That should satisfy you. The operation of the purpose, and, that's, and if we get a chance, we'll get to it. But that's why the tabernacle is so important, because this is a manifestation of the operation of the purpose of Yahweh that he declared right from the beginning. And right from the beginning when he declared this purpose, he stepped into this shape and form to manifest the purpose that he declared. And then when he brought this tabernacle to Moses, in other words, he transfigured into this intangible tabernacle. This is an intangible body. This is an intangible tabernacle. Both of these are actually invisible things only seen by visions and understood by revelations. It's the only way you get, you can't can't see Yahweh Elohim unless you get a vision of him. 
And a vision of him is something that you can see to be able to see the principles about it. And I'll just drop this down real quick because this is the first thing I learned in uh, 1970 in Salina Street uh, uh, class with Burbank Mitchell is the difference between principle and manifestation. And if you can't judge the difference between the principle and the manifestation, you will not be able to understand the purpose. And that's, and that's because we talk about this pure spirit as being principle. This is principle, and I will get into this in a minute, but I just want to read 22, 9.22. Romans 9 and 22. What if Yahweh, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Now, hold on for a second. Uh, uh, I want you to read um, Isaiah 45 and 6. Start at 6. Cause, no, start at, well, yeah, start at 6. Because uh, there's just so much to read. This is one of the things you find in the margin of the translator when Paul says this. I didn't find this. I went to the margin of the translator. This is what the, the carnal minds did this. The carnal minds who studied the scriptures and everything. They knew Paul was talking out of the Law and the Prophets. And they thought, wow, this is cool. We're going to put it in the margin. They didn't understand Yahweh's purpose. But Yahweh had directed them to do this so that we have this at our fingertips. That's right. Read this. Isaiah 45 and 5. I am Yahweh, there's none else. I, there is no Elohim beside now, me. Now, I am Yahweh. There is none else. Now listen, there is no Elohim besides me. In other words, he's Elohim. There's no Elohim. I'm Yahweh. There's no one else. And I'm Elohim. There's none like me. Read. I girded thee, though thou hast not known. Now I clothed you, even though you didn't know me. Read. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the wet. And from the West, that there is none beside me. There is none. Be this is how they know there is none. There's not Yahweh and you and your choice. For you to be able to make a choice, you have to become a uh, 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 self-existing, independent individual from Yahweh to make your choice. You have to become an independent, self-existing person, not a deity, because you're not going to say, oh, I'm not a God, but you're saying you're, you have been separated. Now, we learn right from the beginning that uh, when Yah Yahweh, uh, uh, Elohim, uh, created everything in the creation, that Yahweh, uh, pure spirit, had allotted him a certain amount of pure spirit in order to create this creation. So he's creating it all from Spirit. Everything is spirit materialized. Everything is Yahweh. And here's the thing. Uh, at the core, listen, this is at the core of every single manifestation is a principle. Roman Catholicism has at the core of every single manifestation nothing. And that's the principle of ex nihilo, yes. that God made everything out of nothing. Yes. This is extremely important. Yes, and Dr. Kinley covered this. And Dr. Kinley said this about this word ex nihilo. He said, uh, uh, how did, uh, I'm going to see if I can remember how he put it. He said that, uh, he, this is what he said. He said, as far as man is concerned, Yahweh is ex nihilo. He made everything out of nothing. Yahweh made everything out of... Because they don't understand he made it out of spirit. So man thinks that way, he said. But it's not that way. But that's what Roman Catholicism teaches. The reality is he made something out of substance. That's right. Solid substance. Solid principle. That's right. That is manifested. 
This solid principle is manifested. This solid principle is manifested. And Dr. Kinley covers this uh, in the textbook. That's, I, I brought the textbook and it just to show that, and because I, I, I'm not getting into the Godhead, I'm getting into the difference between principle and manifestation, and how important it is to be able to discern the difference between these two things. So start this again. I am Yahweh, and there is none else. I am Yahweh, and there's none like me. Read. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I this is what Yahweh. he wants them to know. There is none beside me. Read. I am Yahweh, there's none else. I am Yahweh, there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. Now I form the light and create darkness. I made Pharaoh. I created Israel. I did all. Read. I make peace and create evil. I make peace. I create evil. It's my football, my rules. You don't want to play my game with my football and my rules. You're out of here. <laughs> If you can understand that, read. I, Yahweh, do all these things. I, Yahweh, do all these things. And this is what uh, Paul came from when he said, what? And if Yahweh, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured much long suffering of the vessels fitted for wrath, I make peace and I create evil uh, to destruction that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. I make peace and I create evil. I, Yahweh, do all these things. It's never up to a man to do anything. And Paul had it up to here with choice. That's why he, that's what the, he did. And he couldn't see the only thing that you can see with someone who believes they have choices that they have, uh, they can instruct Yahweh. Because, you know, I can have a part of this. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he's clear about that. There is none other. See? And so this, this chapter uh, is so simple to see. For, even a carnal mind has to defy their own logic in order to turn their back on this, yeah. which is what they do. Uh, give me uh, 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 Joshua 24. Uh, 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 let me see if I can get there. Uh, I want to show this. Oh, gosh. Come on. Uh, 20, 20, 21, 23. Let me see. Let me see here. Okay, yeah, you, you, uh, uh, let me see. Start at 14, right. You've got to start at 14. Yes. Joshua 24 and 14. Now, therefore, fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. So now we got serve Yahweh or serve these gods. You got to serve them in sincerity. This, these words are critical because you, me, this is what I, this is what I struggled with. This is what I got into in Syracuse. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, after Trell. My dealings with between me and Yahweh and the struggles that I had being able to believe Yahweh's purpose after looking at who I am, judging my heart and seeing, I can't believe that this could be saved. And struggling with that, trying to understand Yahweh's purpose through this thing. And so uh, this is, this is uh, you have to serve Yahweh in sincerity and truth. And that's hard for you to determine if that's what you're doing. It's tough to know that you're really being sincere because these things are so critical. This idea of choice really is establishing what, what mystery you're in at the end of the day. It doesn't mean that you're committed to that mystery at that time because you can be brought out of that. But if you're not brought out of that, you're going to be lost because that's the nature of the mystery of iniquity to lift himself above 
Yahweh. We read about that. Yeah. And that's what they're doing. They're Because it's all through the book by election. It, it says the words. You can't get away from the words that it says about Yahweh uh, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. You can't get away from that. So, they, but people do. Because I've had people tell me, well, what, what's in the beginning and what's in the end is predestined, but all the stuff in the middle is up for grabs by choice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, read here. Should we read that? Three, as well. Should we do that real quick? Yeah, go, go 13. Uh, Joshua 24 and 13. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you build not, and you dwell in them, of the vineyards and olive yards which he planted. You don't do anything. He, and, and it's over there in the 17th chapter of Acts, uh, uh, where uh, I give all, I, I've, I'm blocking on the 17th chapter of Acts and for crying. Life and breath and all I give man yeah. life and breath and all things. See, this is consistent. It is consistent. All right, go back to where you were now uh, 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 in, in Isaiah, uh, or Joshua, I mean, uh, where you had gotten to, and then read on down. Now, therefore, fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye Yahweh. And if it seem evil unto you to serve Yahweh, Choose you this day. There's your sure. choice. Yeah. <laughs> you are declaring that Yahweh's purpose is evil if you get to choose. Because what are the choices they get if they feel Yahweh is evil? Not good. Read them. Choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods the Amorites in whose land you dwell so here's what you got to choose from every single false god that there is every single theory concept and opinion that there is that's the choice you get you want to make a choice choose one of those <coughs> because Yahweh seems evil to you now, where does Yahweh, how does something seem evil to you? See? The word seem is very important. It, they got a feeling about this thing. They got a feeling about this thing. They're responding about how they feel. I don't feel it's fair. Yeah. And that's a function of the heart, not the head. Yeah. Because the head's being told all over the place, yeah. you don't have a choice. But in your heart, I don't, I don't feel that way. <laughs> this is a function of the heart. Now, I want to do this real quick. Uh, uh, go to uh, 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 Romans, the 10th chapter. Uh, 10 and 9. Romans 10 and 9. Uh, wait a minute, hold on. Hold on. Oh, gosh. Start at 5. Romans 10 and 5. And, yeah, For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man that doeth those things shall live by them. Now, this is the righteousness which is of the law. And this is the righteousness that Yahshua said to John the Baptist, Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness, the righteousness which is of the law. Because that covenant was a covenant of righteousness if they could keep it. But oh, if they such, had such a head in them to keep my law. It's not what it says. Oh, if they had such a heart in them. They didn't have the heart. And because Yahweh hadn't given them the heart, he gave them the physical tabernacle pattern, which the operation of it allowed them to be saved from physical death. Now, their souls are a different story, and Yahweh is judging their souls uh, uh, down through the whole Law and Prophets until the time of after the death, burial, and resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah. And he's down in the, the graves uh, 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 
uh, uh, preaching to them who have slept in the dust of the earth. And they, those the 37th chapter of Ezekiel, those bones come up and they appear as men and march into Jerusalem. And so that's him getting those souls there. Those are the ones, even Mo Moses' soul was in that group. <sighs> John the Baptist's soul was in that group. Why? Because John the Baptist was born with the Holy Spirit, but he was born under the law. It was the Old Covenant. It wasn't the New Testament. It's not the New Testament. It is the, he was the last prophet. He and Isaiah were exactly the same. He and Jeremiah were exactly the same. They were prophets of Yahweh, moved by the Holy Spirit. With Isaiah and Jeremiah, the Holy Spirit would enter, and he, they would speak, and then the Holy Spirit would leave, would enter, and would leave. But, and, and, and that's the same thing that happened with Moses, and it's the same thing that happened with John the Baptist, but what happened to begin was, was the Holy Spirit ent entered at their birth and hung with them for all of their life until just before they died and it left. So it was still temporary. Just because it was the whole length of their life and with Isaiah it was just period of time, period of time, period of time. Jeremy, it doesn't make any difference. The principle is exactly the same. And that's how this thing comes together. That's why the purpose demands that Moses has the Holy Spirit. But you can't see it unless the Holy Spirit in you reveals the principle of it so that you are, con I am confident that when Doc said it, he's a goodly child, that he meant that. Now, I wasn't always confident of that. I never saw the purpose, how it required that in the beginning, because it required that at the ending. It required it to be temporary with Moses, even though it didn't seem to like that, because one could read, well, his eyes were not dim and his natural forces weren't abated, so it was the same Moses. It was not the same Moses. And John the Baptist, after he pointed out the Messiah, Oh, gosh. And the spirit of Yahweh uh, uh, descended uh, on him like a dove. Yahweh Elohim was in Moses and was in uh, Yah Yah Yahshua is Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh. Yahweh Elohim in that physical body. It's a unity. It's all. You can never not read Yahweh. He's never on hold and letting the, the, the creation take care of itself. He's right there, but you can't see it because he's transmuted. But it's still him. He's transmuted, but it's still him because it's his purpose right from the start, and he's not going to leave it. He's not going to send a boy to do a man's job. He's going to come down and do it himself. That's what I was taught in Salina Street in the beginning. Mitchell got up and he said he didn't send a boy to do a man's job. He came and did it himself. Okay. And he's been doing that all along. He came from pure spirit, see, and he did it himself. And he came from the uh, uh, incorporeal. And he did it himself, you understand? And he came uh, into the, uh, well, I'll, I'll hopefully I can get into the, the, the relationship between these two. But uh, uh, this, oh, I'm, I, I, this idea of uh, this principle in manifestation is just so, uh, Read, read here where we are in 22. Or was it 22? No, no, 10. 10 and 9. I'm sorry. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this why. Now, this is, so there was a righteousness under the law, and there was righteousness under faith. Mm -hmm. This is how the righteousness under faith speaks. And we know that this was the righteousness of Yahweh. This, this is righteousness, this is the kingdom of Yahweh, righteousness, peace, and joy in, manifest in that body. The righteousness of Yahweh, this, this law, this is Yahweh's law of righteousness. This tabernacle gave salvation 
or uh, a state of righteousness to these people if the operation was performed exactly as Moses saw it in the top of the mountain. Had to be exact. The structure, the, the building, the organization of it had to be exact. And you get that, uh, that it was in the 40th chapter of Exodus when that thing was dedicated. Do you understand? Now, uh, read on here. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Wait a minute. Uh, uh, we're in 10 and 9. 10 and 6. 10 and 6. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring the Messiah down from above. We're not talking about say not in your head. We're talking about don't say this in your heart. In your head, even a carnal mind can agree with the way the law and prophets go together. A carnal mind can agree that the name is Yahshua, not Yahweh. You show them there's no J, no Jesus. They haven't, and there are organizations out there that have been using uh, uh, Yahweh and Yahshua longer than I knew the name was Yahweh and Yahshua. So, it, this purpose actually makes logical sense because it goes according to a pattern, and a pattern makes logical sense once you understand the pattern. So it makes logical sense, but that's not sufficient. But it is necessary for you to have the knowledge. It is necessary for you to understand the operation of this tabernacle pattern. Because as, and this was my testimony, I think it was in Wednesday's class, about how I did not have any appreciation for this tabernacle pattern uh, and this body. And in uh, 1972, Mitchell put me up in uh, uh, Utica. And uh, Diane's parents were there. She, they asked her, what do you want for your birthday? It was her birthday. What do you want for your birthday? She said, I want you to come to class. So they came to class, and they were sitting there, and Mitchell came up to me, and he goes, I want you to get into the body tabernacle. <laughs> And I was a scientist. I was the perfect person to do it because I know the names of the body parts without stumbling over them and stuff like that. And so I got up and I did the body tabernacle. And to me, it was a dry lecture because I did the body tabernacle. I did it from here. I didn't do it from here. And I knew I... I knew it didn't mean anything to me, but it didn't make any difference that it didn't mean anything to me because other things that were taught, this meant something to me. This, when I saw this, that first time I was in class, the difference between principle and manifestation, Yahshua showed me concretely how this is the ultimate way to work. Now, I didn't have any of the details, but I knew that there's, in the you know, three blocks plus three blocks is six blocks. And so three plus three is six. But you've never seen a three before. It's a principle. I was right on board with that. But the body tabernacle, uh, you know, and, and, and I was wondering, well, where would the liver be? Where would the pancreas be? You don't even have an intestine. Or you don't even have a... a, 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 a other parts, you know, there's just too many parts of the Bible that you don't have. And so I just sit, laid that all aside because I didn't have answers for that. But I didn't care that I didn't have answers for that because I had other answers that kept me in class. And it, and it couldn't come from here. And I would have been the perfect person for this, for me to embrace this in my heart because I have the knowledge of it. I was going to school for it. But that wasn't sufficient. Yahweh had to reveal to me, you understand, uh, the significance of a pattern that reveals principle, not manifestations. I was working a manifestation with an altar, a manifestation with this, and I wasn't seeing the principle. And that's why Trell's uh, uh, lecture on Wednesday was so powerful, because he was talking about blood, water, spirit, death, burial, and resurrection, and revealing the underlying principles that, uh, that dictate this pattern. And, and, I, and I had already finally seen that. Now, 
this body, oh gosh, this, this, this body, this is a vision of Yahweh Elohim. This is not Yahweh Elohim. This hands, feet, and the body is a vision of Yahweh Elohim. And Dr. Kinley talks about this in the textbook. I just want to read one part about this because this is the thing. This, I had this on my phone and I left my phone at Frank's. <laughs> so, because I really didn't, I, I'm not, and I, honestly, it's not that I'm getting into the Godhead, I'm just getting into the difference between principle and manifestation. That's what I want to show. This is in the uh, 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 theosophy um, part of the, you know, the uh, exegetical analysis and theosophy and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let me see here. I can find it. Uh, Oh, I'm not finding it. Oh, gosh. I knew I should have kept my phone with me. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, here it is. So it's talking about the, the, the group of plates, uh, Theosophy and Godhead, the one that on the 40 plate chart has all the little hearts with the attributes on it. And then it has uh, this shape and form that encompasses from the uh, court roundabout to the holy place, to the most holy place, and this is where the veils are mentioned, which is coming from the court roundabout to the holy place. You go through the veil of unseen or invisibility. So you have visibility here, and then you go past the veil. Now you're in, in the presence of invisibility. And, and then you have the, these are the two veils. The veils that come down are inscrutability and incomprehensibility. And the high priest gets past those veils. And he brings the breastplate past those veils. And so that's why you read in John 4, 24, or 118, because I always get those mixed up, that uh, uh, Yahweh is spirit and uh, they that worship him must worship him. In, no. Uh, what, uh, 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 no man has seen God that's, that's what I want to thank you. No man has seen Yahweh at any time. The only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father. This is why the heart. And, and I have a list, a long list in, of every place in the Old Testament where it talks about it happens in the heart. Never does it talk about it happens in the head. And you can't control your heart. You can't make a heart decision. You, can, you can't do it with a woman or a man. You fall in love with a worst case scenario man and your mother and father want to get you out of it. You can't. They Look at this nice guy. He's got money. He's, you want the trailer guy. And, and because you're motivated. You're moved by your heart. And you don't even, and you don't even know that happens. It's both ways, with men and with women. That's the attraction. Yahweh has made it that way as a manifestation of a principle. Now, uh, so in this case, uh, uh, so these group selected that, that these are, he, it's, now it's talking about, uh, I'm on page 58 in this, but I believe it's on page 57 in the, the ringed one. But it's volume one. one. Volume 1, yes, yes, Volume 1. It's right under the Theosophy or Divine Wisdom. So it says, uh, Yahweh, uh, series, so these group of plates have been selected on the chart, series number 2, to define Yahweh, who is spirit, John 4, 24. <laughs> <laughs> now, Yahweh, and you've got to keep track of the pronouns and the names. Yahweh is the ultimate source the infinite and immaculate substance, the incomprehensible and inscrutable principle. So you have uh, uh, Yahweh. And Dr. Kinley and some of his transcripts have, has used the word pure spirit. I had someone tell me, Dr. Kinley never used the term pure spirit. Oh, yes, he did. And the reason it's pure spirit, because we're up at the very original ultimate source, this inscrutable source. This is principle. 
This is the principle of Yahweh. And it is invisible, every bit as much as you've never seen a three before. You've never seen love before. You've never seen intelli intelligence before. That's, that is principle. Now, this says... Uh, uh, the, he's the ultimate source, the infinite, immac uh, the infinite immaculate substance, the incomprehensible and inscrutable principle, the all in all. Now, he's an eternal, independent, self-existing deity without shape or form. Now, it says this, now Yahweh, now we're still talking about Yahweh, pure spirit, was manifested in two invisible parts, not visible parts, two invisible parts which could be seen only by visions that's why it's it's invisible and you have to have a vision the thing that's why uh, uh, this is a vision this is not Yahweh Elohim this is a manifestation this is a visionary manifestation of Yahweh Elohim and this your body is a physical manifestation of Yahweh Elohim it's a physical manifestation. And Dr. Kinley said that this body, your body, is the most complete example of Yahweh Elohim. Cannot be Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Cannot be improved upon, you understand. And that's both your body as spirit, soul, and body, and head, chest, and abdomen. The structure of your body and the physiology of your body. And we're going to get to these two examples. There's manifestations in structure and function. Those are manifestations of a principle. So, uh, so it says, uh, um, Yahweh was manifest in two invisible parts, which could only be seen by visions as the Word and the Holy Spirit. So you've got Yahweh, one principle, and he's manifested in two invisible, these are invisible. This is the Word, or Son, and this is the Holy Spirit. Invisible. Invisible manifestations of Yahweh. We're past manifestations of your body in the tabernacle. Now, now we're looking at spiritual manifestations of principle. That's why this is a unity. These cannot be uh, 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 separated. And yet, because we have the manifestations, we can understand them and their relationship. But they can't be, these can't be separated. This is Yahweh manifesting as the invisible word that Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu and 70 elders saw a vision of, but they didn't know anything about what they were looking at. Moses saw this vision transfigure into this threefold intangible tabernacle that when it was built down here in the wilderness of Sinai was the salvation of Israel from their sins. This is Yahshua made manifest in the wilderness of Sinai. And that's this invisible principle. You got the Yahweh Elohim uh, the, in all his, man, all his manifestation and then you have See, this is the body, this is the structure, and this is, his, this is his function. This is his physiology. And because Yahshua, look at physiology is how your body works, right? You, your digestion and all that, it's how it works. It's what makes it run. Look at, so here comes Yahshua, and he's showing you how Yahweh Elohim works. He undergoes a death. You don't see Yahweh Elohim undergoing a death. Now you understand the principle had to be that when Yahweh took on these manifestations, that was a death to him because you could only know part of him, so you couldn't know all of him. So now you're in a situation where you don't have the whole story, but you have sufficient for the purpose that he has declared. And it's not and he, and he is greater than this purpose. This purpose is only a part of him. And so for him, uh, when you see that, and you see all the glory of that, to him, it's a death. There's so much more of me to see. Uh, but the principle of death now is not negative. It's an example of a lacking, which death is an example of a lacking of life for us. 
uh, because we say, well, so-and-so died, but they really didn't die because you know the soul lived on. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, this is, but he didn't really die because the soul lived on. There's a principle there. And so what, what you have is that uh, uh, Yahshua did the dying that people could see. Yahshua was baptized that people could see. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit was poured out on him that at least John uh, the Baptist saw that. And, and it says in your book, now listen, oh, this, is, this killed me. It says in your book that uh, the, the, the dove came down from heaven or something like that, uh, descended from heaven and lighted upon him like a dove. But that's not what happened as far as a carnal mind interprets heaven, coming from the sky, coming from the clouds. That dove came from John the Baptist, out of John the Baptist and into Yahshua. Just like with Moses, that Holy Spirit came out of Moses and into Yahshua. And you have the same thing with El Yah and El Shua. And it happened at the same place, at the River Jordan, with the mantle uh, that Yah El Yah gave to El Shua. It was at the Jordan River when uh, this spirit transferred to uh, uh, Yahshua, the son of Nun. It was at the Jordan River when the spirit uh, uh, moved John the Baptist to baptize Israel. He baptized him at the Jordan River, but not just some place at the Jordan River. That always took place where that Ark of the Covenant went through. Why? Because there were 12 stones that were planted there to let you know that's the spot that they went through that veil. No other way. And Dr. Kinley worked with you. Had to go in on the left side and come out on the right side. You, you weren't parting that veil. There was one way in and one way out. There was one way in and one way out here. One way in and one way out here. One way in on this side and one way out on this side. One way in there. It's always been the same. Why? Because Dr. Kinley talks about these attributes. Intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom. Uh, uh, sidebar. Uh, uh, intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom. Uh, a triad. He calls it a, a decade. But it, it's a triad. Uh, uh, why he calls it a decade, I haven't got a clue. But he said, and then um, beauty, love, and justice emanate from those. This is the bringing forth of Yahweh Elohim. This is the bringing forth of that shape and form. It emanates, and then uh, foundation, power, and strength emanate from this. And, I've, and I, years and years ago, uh, in, in Oceanside's class, I went out to a, a toy store, and I got one of these... Uh, so you can see ships from far away. What do you call Periscope. Uh, what is it? Telescope? No, just this. And, and it collapses on itself. And the, you see the, the, the buccaneers. They're looking for your goal. And they close it back up. And that's what I had to show this. And it came out in three pieces. So that you could have it and you could see far away. You had to get it all the way extended to, to see, to use it. It had to all the way come out to be used. And so, and, and then it was just in the last five or six years that I saw that uh, transcript where he said that, that beauty, love, and justice emanated from intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom. This is a process. This purpose is not just stamped. Boom. This purpose is an active, living process that's moving like a baby in a womb even. And so the head is formed first, and then the heart they measure, and then the intestines comes later. But they all emanate from that DNA. It's all emanated from, the, that, from that one egg. It just comes forth, and that's what he's talking about. So that's what's happening here. And I know I have these split like this, but they're split not because they're separate. They're split because they represent two different aspects of the purpose. This represents the structure. And this represents the, physiolo the, the, the physiology. 
And you cannot separate the structure from the physiology, the priesthood from the, the vessels in this tabernacle. It is required. That's why it, you can't have a tabernacle without having the law of Yahweh in it. That's what you've got going on in the 40th chapter of Exodus. And so it's a unity. It's a unity. But it's a structure and a function. And you are a head, a chest, and an abdomen. And you never think of yourself as three people. So you experience the actual principle of a unity that has a Trinitarian foundation as far as man would think it. But a doctor looks at it and says, that's you. And your heart is connected to the head. And it's connected to the it's connected all the way down to the toes and the fingers, the way that works. Everything is in, there is not anything separate. Everything talks to everything in your body, believe it or not. Everything is it's a unity, but it's made to have a head cavity. So it's made to have a point that represents intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom. And it's made to have a, a, a chest cavity, a heart, where the heart uh, delivers uh, uh, deoxygenated blood to the lungs. And it's oxygenated or given spirit and comes back down out of that mountain and separates it to the whole body. You understand? And so, that good or evil, cancer or not cancer, that blood goes to the whole body. And so, uh, that's why these two really are the tabernacle together, both uh, 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 structure and function. Now, let me finish reading this, because this is not done. Uh, uh, in plate three, uh, this is the Godhead plate. That's what it says. In plate three, Yahweh was manifested in two invisible parts, which could be seen only by visions as the Word and the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the end of the sentence. The end of the sentence is critical. And he says, to make himself and his purpose known to mankind. Yahweh himself. He's doing this to make Yahweh man was manifest in two invisible parts, which could be seen by visions, only seen by visions, as the Word and the Holy Spirit, to make himself and his purpose known to mankind. That's why the Word can declare. That's why we're declaring this to mankind. That's what we're doing. Now watch. This is himself. and his purpose. So this is the structure in these vessels. Uh, uh, intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom. Uh, beauty, love, and justice. Foundation, power, and strength. Or however they would go. But just, you understand, that's the structure. And the operation of the high priest in there all the way to taking Israel and the Gentiles that he has chosen from the beginning because this pattern laid out was dictated right from the beginning to operate exactly how it operated. And it was said that those uh, uh, 12 stones would be, that's the remnant of all the seeds. Those are the ones who were saved, that ones that he brought in. And the Gentiles, see, those are the many. This, the Gentiles and the Jews after Pentecost are Yahweh's body broken for you. Yahweh Elohim's body broken for you. Yahshua's body broken for you. That's what he said. Eight, take, eat. This is my body. Broken for you. Yahweh Elohim, before Pentecost, was not available to mankind. And nobody knew that Yahweh Elohim's name was Yahshua back then. They only used the title. El Shaddai or Yahweh Elohim. They did not know what his name was. And you will read, and we've been in Judges in Ithaca's class. Ithaca's class is phenomenal. The way Bob has been running Judges all the way down through the last three classes that he had in Ithaca with 
the opening up this judges. And so there was a little wrestling match uh, in this last one, I think it was. And during the wrestling match, I think it was Gideon asked, well, what's your name? And he said, it's a secret. Why do you, he goes, why do you ask? It's a secret. And he wouldn't give it. There was another wrestling match with Jacob down there where his thigh got disjointed. And he asked, what is your name? And he didn't get it. Because under the law, you cannot know that Yahweh Elohim is the salvation of Yahweh, even though he is the pattern which manifests the salvation of Israel from being killed with big rocks. It's, this is how this unity, and it's, you've got, if you see how this is just stretching out, coming forth in an understanding and then going back. That's the end declared from the beginning. But it goes back in uh, power, uh, the power of our understanding, of our becoming uh, a part of the body. And so the understanding is not in the head. The under, well, it is. Because it turns out it's, it's all the way through. But the point is, it has to be in the heart. And in your family, your, you love your physical family more than you love my physical family. And I don't fault you for that because I love my physical family more than I love your physical family. But I'm sitting with Frank a couple times now, staying with him and talking with him about all of the experiences with his family and all the things. And I could sense the love that he had, whether his family accepted the gospel or not, whether there was a fight or not, his heart goes out to them. And I, and you all do. And it's a manifestation of this principle of this family. And Yahweh Elohim, Yahshua, was going to give, uh, 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 bring the plenty. The plenty didn't come at this point. But when this Yahweh Elohim uh, 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 went on this cross and went through a death, burial, and resurrection, and the Holy Spirit was poured out, that is the fulfillment of the purpose. Because the purpose was to bring forth an increase. That's what we have with the circles. And you can't bring forth an increase with this. You can just reserve those souls until the Messiah has come and bring the increase. It's the reserving of these souls. Uh, 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 but it's him who now breaks his body. And on the day of Pentecost, 120 in the upper room, his body was broken. They went down and they preached that morning and 3,000 came in. Body was broken. And this, and I'm just going to say this and I'm going to, there's just so much. Uh, uh, Sasha worked with the seven brides who brought, who were barren and brought forth sons in, I guess it was Ithaca's class on Sunday. You may not have been there because of the pain in your leg. But he worked with the seven brides who brought forth, there were seven of them. And, and I'm, I have what is called a loosely associated, I'm loosely associated in my thinking. I worked with a psychiatrist in work and I was teaching him things. And so he, he and I became friends. And he said to me, you know, you're loosely associated. I didn't even know what that was. But what it is, is that my mind, and it's just a physical thing. It's not a spiritual thing or anything like that. But when my mind sees something, I see it, how it applies to things that are strange. But they apply. I'm loosely associated. I'm not strictly, I see this and that's what I see and I can't see anything else. And I just do that. And it made me very valuable as a scientist in the lab because I could see problems coming because I could see how things went together. Well, anyways, so I'm sitting in class and Sasha's working these seven brides and the seven brides bring, each one brings forth a son. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, two of them are not named and, and four of them are, four, five, six, five of them are, are named, two of them are not named. And as soon as I saw, heard the seven brides, I thought, well, 
you have a seven branch candlestick and you have uh, an aorta, right? And the fourth branch is the innominate, the unnamed. And the fourth bride wasn't named. So I'm thinking, well, there you, you don't have a name of who her mother is because in the candlestick, it, it, the fourth is unnamed. And so, and that's when Yahshua comes in and he's, uh, his, Yahshua's mother was not, they didn't know the name of Yahshua's mother. Now they called it Mary. But we say Mary wasn't her egg. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Her name, Yahshua's mother's name was not known. And that uh, 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 other woman whose name was not known was a very special thing happened to her son. Her son died. And El, yeah, El Shua takes her son, brings her dead son up to the bed, and lays on him face to face, feet to feet, and hands to hand. And Sasha described it. That's a cross. That is a death, a burial, and he resurrected that son. That unnamed mother of that particular son, which is the only son of those seven sons that went through a death, burial, and a resurrection. In a, as a man, and so that link in my loosely associated mind took me all the way over to Yahshua, whose mother's name was not known, because this, in principle, was the mother and father of this physical body. That uh, because he was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, but at the Holy Spirit at this time was only manifest as Yahweh Elohim. He had not yet broken his body down to be the Holy Spirit, but that's what it was. This is the Holy Spirit unavailable to mankind in any way except by visions. No revelations yet, just by visions. And that's why they can't keep it together. But at, at Pentecost, this body was broken for you. This Holy Spirit was broken for you and was a finally available to mankind in their hearts because he went to Israel and, and, and uh, what's his name? Nathaniel said, I've, we found him who Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Yahshua of Nazareth. They knew that. They believed the scriptures as Yahshua taught it to them. But it wasn't in their heart manifested by uh, 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 Peter denying Yahshua three times. He wasn't being bad to Yahshua or Peter. He wasn't punishing Peter. As a matter of fact, P Peter had, was the only one that had the strength to be able to, to withstand that and still uh, 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 believe the Messiah that he himself failed the Messiah when he was asked at the fire. Oh, weren't you with him? No, he denied him. Denied him three times, and then the rising sun bird, the cock crew, that's the one that declares the rising sun, and that's Joshua raising from the dead. And so uh, this idea of being able to get back to principle and realizing that is the only core, solid, eternal aspect of Yahweh's purpose. And it's been manifested now to us and in purposes before it's been manifested in other ways and purposes after it's going to be manifested in other ways, but it's always going to go the same way. This, this Yahweh is infinite in his uh, 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 in who he is, in what he is, in these attributes. He's infinite in that. And he can't, he can't manifest the infinity of himself in one shot. It's got to come bit by bit, little by little. And each time it comes, there's an increase. And that's why the Holy Spirit uh, is my body broken for you. And my mind, I'll just finish this, my mind went to the uh, uh, seven loaves of bread that the Messiah Gate. They had seven. How many loaves of bread you got? I got seven. Well, take them out. And they broke those, right? And they fed multitudes. This is my body broken for you. And so uh, that's uh, what I was inspired with, with Trell. And this is what Yahweh has 
worked on me since I first came to class in Salina Street, the difference between principle and manifestation. And I didn't know how deep those differences went before. I didn't know this way that it went. And I just read this part about two invisible manifestations like a few months ago. I didn't even know that was there. And so, and it just, it, it explained to me how Yahweh talked about uh, uh, these decades coming out from each other and then going back. Uh, it's never separated. It's never a trinity. Uh, anyways, I'm, uh, I'm done. Thank you for the time. And uh, I'll okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Amler. That concludes this evening's class. Y'all could rise for the doxology. And now unto Yahshua, who alone is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Yahshua, our Savior, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and for all times, I'll say. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.